I'm Danny, David's uh, chair and co-chair. Uh, thank you, welcome, because uh, it's top of mind. It's top of my mind. It, I believe it's probably top of everyone's mind. I wanted to just uh, do a short prayer for the state of Israel. Um, very, uh, very, very trying times. Um, you know, uh, life does go on, and we're going to have this. Uh, I'm sure it will be a great, great seminar tonight. But um, we can't forget about what's going on um, in, in in Israel. So if you would just, uh, if you know the prayer, I'm, I'm going to do it in English. Uh, uh, Heavenly Father, Avinu Shabbat Shemayim, Protector and Redeemer of Israel. Or Israel. We invoke your blessing upon the state of Israel, which by thy providence has been reborn in the land of our fathers. Shield her with her mercy and spread over her your protecting peace. Bestow the light of your truth upon her leaders and direct them by your good counsel. Sustain the hands of those who build and defend the Holy Land. Grant peace within our borders and security to all of our inhabitants. So, Lord, remember our brethren of the whole house of Israel. Unite our hearts to love and revere you and to keep all the precepts of your Torah that we may be a blessing to all mankind and fulfill unto us the vision of your prophet. Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And let us all say, Amen. 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 All right. David? Okay. Yep. Take Thank you, way. Danny. I, I appreciate that. Um, Can we okay. ask everybody to mute? Yes. yes. Please, everyone Thanks, mute. Guys. Creighton, um, Stan, Rick, mute everybody, please. Dan. We're going to okay. mute everyone. Well, we have, I'll set, well, we have a good one for you tonight. Hello and welcome to Sports Affinity, presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you an opportunity to express yourself through participating in and leading activities that are most important to you. I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Mandel, my co-chair. We're going to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presentation, and we'll be unmuting after presenter's remarks. I am now, it's my pleasure to introduce Ross Greenberg. Um, before I do that, I just really want to thank Ross for doing this, because I'm I, I'm just awed by Ross Greenberg. Before we even start, I have to tell you, I'm awed. I don't get awed very often. I'm, I'm in awe, so here we go. Ross Greenberg graduated from Brown University with a degree in political science. In 2011... Ross, Green, Ross, Greenberg, Ross created Ross Greenberg Productions after a 33-year career at HBO. He served as vice president and executive producer of HBO Sports from 1985 through 1990, senior vice president and executive producer from 1990 to 2000, and then president of HBO Sports from 2000 to 2011. Ross is recognized as one of the most innovative producers and best storytellers in television history. He now brings his creativity and vision to a larger audience and a wider variety of programming opportunities. And now, Ross Greenberg. So before we give you Ross, I just I, I was remiss for not giving us everyone here the ground rules because some of you might be new to this. Uh, so we're going to have our, our guest Ross speak. Uh, if you have questions for Ross, we uh, ask you please to put them into the chat. Please stay muted throughout this entire presentation. Ross will either ask you the questions directly from the chat or I will feed them to you after his presentation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ross. Thank you very much. I want to echo your words in that prayer because uh, this has been a very difficult two or three days. I know many of you have been watching the television and it's you know it's it's really scary and it's uh upsetting and uh just i hope we all get through it and i just pray for all of you if you have loved ones in israel we're all thinking of you and this is just horrific and great um so i guess the best way to do this is for me to tell you a story because every great uh, every great documentary, every yeah. every series I've ever done, including every prize fight and live event yeah. I've, been, I've always attacked it 
as a story. Each independent boxing match was a story. Each match at, the, at Wimbledon was a story. Every documentary was obviously a story. And so I have a story. So I grew up, uh, I was born actually in San Antonio, Texas, uh, 1955. And my dad moved, he was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, and moved to San Antonio. Uh, his dad moved the family there. And I grew up though in Scarsdale, New York, um, which is a sleepy little community outside of New York uh, that obviously uh, was upper crust, even though my dad probably stretched his bank account and took care of his two boys uh, more than anything else and, and, and really started me in the world of sports. Um, he was a University of Texas three-year uh, student who then went off to World War II, um, stationed in San Antonio and teaching people how to fly airplanes. But um, he was really a, a sports fan at heart. And I guess when you go to the University of Texas, and he was actually in the band, uh, he also obviously followed the football to a large degree. So immediately in Scarsdale, I attached myself to that sport and he couldn't get giant tickets. So he ended up getting New York jet tickets uh, at Shea Stadium when it first came on line. And my brother and I would go up to, I think, section 406 upper deck. I always wondered why we were in the upper deck since he had season tickets. And I realized that at $6 a ticket, that was enough for him to spend on every Sunday. Uh, so anyway, we, we go to those jet games for a couple of years and then in walks with white shoes, Joe Willie Namath. And that experience of, of being at that stadium uh, with that charismatic superstar taking the field, we used to get there an hour and a half early just to watch him throw warmups where he heaved the ball 50 yards right into the hands of a Matt Snell or a Don Maynard or a George Sauer just working out. And he, obviously during the game, he was electric. Um, mostly took the game on his shoulders early and then had the magical year in 68. Um, but as I was growing up, I was also playing the game. And as luck would have it, uh, Frank Gifford lived down the street and he had a son named Kyle Gifford. And Kyle and I were best friends. So I would hang at Kyle's house and Frank would be there on occasion. And uh, he became like a second dad. Uh, we both started playing football in third grade. And as time went on, uh, Frank started exposing me to sports television through ABC Sports. And in those days, if you remember, there were three networks, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And that was pretty much it when it came to sports on television, uh, when it came to television at all, if all of you were getting to the ripe old age of 68 like me. So I followed Frank, obviously. He had obviously retired from the Giants and went on to have a glorious career as a commentator for ABC Sports. And I happened to live on the 15th hall of Wingfoot. And lo and behold, there were a couple of, there was a U.S. Open played in 1974 at Wingfoot and Frank got myself and Kyle a job as a spotter, um, which is basically going up into one of those towers and sitting with an announcer. I was assigned to a, a nice old chap from England by the name of Henry Longhurst. Um, and the idea was that you were going to tell your announcer, who was hitting when. And I diligently, you know, early in the day, wanted to go the extra yard. So I went out onto the course and measured distances for him uh, from different spots, you know, on the second shot and had a wonderful experience doing that. And I felt like I was in Disney World uh, most of the time with that job. And so then we hooked on and did more and more events 
over summers, usually obviously because we were both in school. And in the junior year at Brown, uh, I decided that even though mom wanted me to go to law school and I took the LSAT and she kept saying, lawyer, 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 lawyer. But I had in my blood this magical sports television concept. Um, just to give you one reason, and this is, I always tell kids today, it's about following your passion. When I was a kid and I used to watch a, a sporting event, if it was Jim McKay calling the Olympic Games and Bill Toomey was coming down the stretch of the decathlon, and I can still remember his words in the dark of night saying, and Bill Toomey is you know, down the stretch and it looks like Bill Toomey will win the marathon. I'm not the marathon, the decathlon. And, uh, and I remember tears coming down my eyes because I was always the kind of kid that always imagined that I was in the head of the athlete that had worked his entire life for that one moment. You know, I was at the 1968 Super Bowl and obviously I was a huge Jet fan. But at the end of that game, I wasn't just crying for myself or my father or, you know, this magical moment, but for Joe Willie and Matt Snell and Don Maynard and all those Jets who had now lived their ultimate dream. And I always saw sports that way, um, the human drama. Uh, so when I got out of Brown, I went to ABC Sports and started working freelance. Obviously, I had gotten attached to a lot of the production personnel there. And I decided that that would be my career, even though mom wanted that law school. Um, and I graduated and drove 17 hours to Cincinnati to sit behind the director and tell him if a lefty or a righty was coming up to the plate so he could know which camera from which dugout to take in his first shot of that particular at bat. And from that point on, I was completely hooked. And the only problem was that that was in, let's say, May. And in September, they were going to get around to hiring full-time production assistants. Um, during that season, you know, I ended up doing a, a maybe a soup, uh, Monday night football game in the summer when camp started. And then I would do a series of college football games through the fall for ABC but I couldn't land that production assistant full-time job. So I started looking for a job in sports tech. We lost the sound. I lost the sound. Oh God! He's Ross muted. Appears to be muted. Ross is muted. Uh, I'll mute him. I'm back. Mute. I'm back. So, so I wrote down the name and number of a gentleman at HBO, and I send him a blind letter. And lo and behold, I get a call back because there were two people in the sports department: this person buying product, and then there was one person in production, and they needed a production assistant. So Tim Brain had me come to his office. And on the way out of his office, I ran into Marty Glipman. Many of you probably remember Marty. Um, and I had actually gone to a summer camp uh, for overprivileged kids once. And I convinced Kyle to go with me, by the way, who convinced Frank to let Kyle go with me. Um, and it was a ski tennis thing for six weeks in Europe, skiing on glaciers, okay? So Marty ran the camp. And Marty, you know, when he wasn't broadcasting, he created this camp, made some extra money, but got to ski in the summers with kids. So when I left that meeting with Tim Brain, Marty started, you know, talking to me and we, re, you know, hugged each other. And, and I know he walked into Tim Brain's office after I left and said, hire that kid. Um, is there luck? Yeah, every career has luck. So I started HBO. And Tim Brain, the uh, producer, started sending me out at the age of 23 to produce events because it was me and him. And so 
you know, I was trial by fire, all of a sudden, a 23 year old producer. Uh, one of the first events I did was a Sugar Ray Leonard fight in Boston, Massachusetts against Dick Ackland. And if you saw the movie, The Fighter, you know, goes around, comes around all those years later, Mark Wahlberg gave me a call and said he wanted us to shoot the fight scenes um, for for the Leonard Eklund fight in the movie. And uh, so that was one uh, occurrence in my career. But um, so we started doing a series of big fights uh, and they got bigger. And at the time, Marty Glickman had also invented midweek coverage of tennis uh, at Wimbledon on HBO. Because everyone takes for granted, you know, watching early round coverage of golf tournaments and tennis tournaments. The only problem was no one in television had ever thought or could break into afternoon coverage during the week. But Marty said, why don't we do it at HBO for Wimbledon? So in 1975, HBO started broadcasting Wimbledon. So every year for 21 straight years, I was off to Wimbledon and producing Wimbledon um, for HBO. And of course we had inside the NFL and time went on and you know the fights got bigger. All of a sudden there was Leonard Hagler, Hearns and Duran and there was Larry Holmes and Michael Spinks and there was that little, that fairly solid uh, heavyweight out of Northern New York named Mike Tyson who came around. And that's when the world really changed uh, because now, you know, Leonard and Hearns was the first Super Bowl of boxing. Uh, I was 26 years old in the truck, and I'll never forget Michael Fuchs, who was then chairman, walked in and folded his arms, and he said, men, we've arrived. Uh, meaning that all of a sudden we were doing the Super Bowl of boxing. HBO was now the king of a sport. And in those days, cable television wasn't what it was today. Uh, ESPN was two years old when we did Leonard Hearns. So always I remembered one thing, and that was that every event, and I said this at the top, has a story to tell, and there are little subplots circling around a, a story. And two fighters were getting in the ring, but their story of their lives beforehand, back to my original statement about working their whole lives for a moment uh, come into, comes into context. And, and I decided that I would treat the humanity and the, uh, the will of these athletes as much as I would awe at their beautiful artistic talent as athletes. And that philosophy came from the great Rune Arledge at ABC Sports. Um, you know, just a, a side story. One of the most incredible moments in the history of sports television is when Jim McKay and, and Rune Arledge were sitting on a plane coming back from one of the first, I think the first event overseas that they had done for um, ABC's Wide World of Sports, another title that probably jogs your memories. And on that napkin, they were trying to figure out what would be the words that would be at the opening of ABC's Wide World of Sports. And they came up with the thrill at victory, the agony of defeat, the beauty and uh, drama of athletic competition. This is ABC Sports, Wide World of Sports, or whatever, I'm paraphrasing. But those words really dictated the entire philosophy of Rune and I once ran into Rune in the 80s, late 80s, probably early 90s. And I said to him, I pulled him aside. It was at, at, uh, at Madison Square Garden. And I pulled him aside and I said, Rune, I just want to tell you that when I came to HBO in 1978, from learning from you during the 70s, all I did was change the letters HBO. Everything I've done philosophy-wise at HBO is what you did at ABC Sports. And um, I think I touched him because nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, nothing could be more accurately the truth. Uh, you know, he set the standard and he set the goal 
of telling it like it is and hiring people like Howard Cosell. Um, and I would go to HBO and that was one of the things I felt most secure about was to go and dig out and find talent that would all tell it like it is. Um, whether it's Larry Merchant, Jim Lampley, Brian Gumbel for Real Sports and a host of great reporters there. Um, Mary Carrillo, Frank DeFord, and so on and so forth. But also get athletes like Sugar Ray Leonard and George Foreman and, uh, you know, Arthur Rash, Billie Jean King. Uh, the names are a who's who of sports. But I always said to myself, make sure that when you get in their ear and talk to them during a broadcast, you're encouraging them to tell it as they see it. Um, and tell it like it is, which was Howard's famous line. Uh, that was most important to me. The other thing that was most important to me as time went on was to create programming which didn't exist anywhere else. Um, you know, all the documentaries that we did beginning in the 80s, really, at first it was a little bit of a little bit of amateurish presentation. Uh, most documentaries back then were just taking some interviews and interjecting them with highlights of the action and the story you're trying to tell. But then in 1990, we did a, sh a show called When It Was a Game, where two gentlemen came in my office and said, hey, the president of Manischewitz happened to be in the front row at Ebbets Field and he had a 16 millimeter camera and he took all this color footage in the Brooklyn Dodgers and he has piles of it in his attic. And, you know, we used a little of it, they said for a Dodgers retrospective documentary. And I said, well, wait a second, wait a second. If that existed here in New York with the Brooklyn Dodgers, there's gotta be piles and piles of color home movies all over this country in St. Louis and Boston, you know, Los Angeles, everywhere that the game of baseball has been played. Uh, and lo and behold, we, I said, let's do a search. And so for six months, we just searched all over America and found a hundred hours of color home movie footage of baseball from the invention of color footage in 1939, all the way through, obviously, the, the early 60s. And I decided to entitle the show called When It Was a Game, which would look back at the innocence and the beauty and the glory and the just, you know, the, the baseball as it was. And for six months, we also labored over, okay, how are we gonna do this? What's the art behind this show? How are we gonna put it together? And to this day, I don't think I've been more proud of any documentary we've ever done. Now, I would love all of you that haven't seen it to see it, I have no way. I do know for a fact that you can actually YouTube when it was a game, um, but uh, I encourage you all to take a look at it uh, because it's, it's something special. We ended up doing three of them, but that set, uh, in motion, and Dewey was probably at every single premiere, about 80 to 100 documentary screenings of each one of these special moments or personality, uh, you know, uh, portraits or just sports history uh, that we did over many, many years in HBO. And I've actually continued to do them since 2011 when I formed my own production company. Um, I just spoke of Bill Russell sitting on Netflix for all of you to, to take a look at at some point um, because it, it we love the way that turned out. But I think in every case, I was using my own personal background and my experiences around the world of sports since I was a little kid at eight years old and focusing on what were the stories that were most significant, that were most powerful, that had the most societal implications, the, the most uh, layered 
kind of storytelling and pick the ones that I thought, along with taking the suggestions from other people uh, that were the most compelling. And so Curse of the Bambino, Bird Magic, um, uh, Ted Williams, and I'm hitting a lot of Boston here for you, but uh, Babe Ruth, Joe DiMaggio, um, the women's soccer team, which I'm now making into a film for Netflix on the 99ers, the Mia Hamm, Julie Foudy, uh, you know, um, team that, that really pioneered the value and the impact of women's sports in America. If you think about it, they were the first team taken seriously, filling 93,000 seats at the Pasadena Rose Bowl. Um, and then, of course, there was what I guess I'll probably see, and I won't see it, but it'll probably be in some kind of obituary of mine. Uh, in, in 2002 or so, I had the idea that I never answered the question as to why that hockey game in Lake Plaston in 1980 was so powerful uh, in this country. And I'm getting chills even talking about it. Um, I'll never forget I was on a plane uh, and I was going from LA back to New York. And and I, I was going to miss the game because it was on television at six o'clock and I was in the air. And uh, it was, you know, this was the Friday night semifinal against the Soviet Union. Um, so and on the plane, the pilot started giving the score period by period, you know. Uh, he'd announce Soviet Union one in the United States zero every time there was a goal scored because he was keeping track up front. Uh, thank God he was also paying attention to the plane ride. But um, so lo and behold, in the third period, he announces United States. He said at the end of the game, he announces the score of Soviet Union three, United States four. And I'm telling you, 120 people on that plane jumped out of their seats and started screaming. And right then and there, I said to myself, wait a second, this is no ordinary hockey game. There's too much surrounding this. And obviously, you know, the hostage crisis was going on, the, the gas lines were going on, the, this country was in a terrible state. Um, and you know, the inflation was out of control. And I said to myself, okay, this is in 2002, let's explore it. Let's really dig and put together a documentary called Do You Believe in Miracles? off of Al Michaels' last line in the game. And, you know, while I was doing it, I met with uh, Herb Brooks' agent and I said, look, you know, this, is also a movie. So this not only is going to be a documentary, th this is an unbelievable movie that needs to be made. And so I, I signed him, his life rights up, Herb Brooks. And at the time, you know, I was, uh, I was like renegotiating my contract in the mid nineties and I knew I wanted to make movies. And I convinced HBO to, if I had come up with an idea for a movie, I would approach HBO first, but then if they didn't buy it, I could go out and try and sell it, and sell it theatrically. And so HBO did pass on Miracle. And I went to Disney and I said, um, you know, what do you think? Or actually the guy just said, what are you doing now? It was kind of an introductory meeting with someone at Disney who, you know, was involved in acquisition for film. And I said, uh, well, I'm making a documentary on the 1980 hockey team. And he almost fell off his chair and immediately bought what is now known as Miracle. Um, pride and joy that one. I think uh, I still, you know, it's one of those movies that lives on. Uh, there are so many teams, uh, every sport who the night before a big game will get together and 20 kids or, or whatever will watch the sport 
the, the film just to get themselves psyched up for the next game tomorrow. But anyway, um, and a couple of years before that, you know, 61 at HBO happened. Uh, so I was primed for Miracle because 61 was probably the greatest experience I ever had in my life. Uh, obviously, the movie set was electric. Billy Crystal, I brought in to direct it. Had to convince HBO to allow Billy Crystal to direct it, uh, believe it or not. And uh, his passion for the you know, show was magical. Spending that kind of time with such a genius of a mind and Billy and his passion for the subject was incredible. Um, so those, those kinds of moments happen. You know, feature films have this kind of magical sense to them. But all along the way, you know, the, the, the documentaries were just rolling out. Um, and, you know, every time I'd watch a rough cut, I would get that same tear in my eye that I got as that little kid. Um, and even when I left HBO, you know, I still try to do as many of these stories as I can. I'm constantly digging, constantly getting referrals from people, um, uh, reading things and seeing them as, as dramatic moments. We had a saying at HBO Sports at the time, it was um, make them laugh, make them cry, make them think. And I kind of took that saying and I, I just pounded my staff. Um, and, and I think I got through, uh, you know, and I think um, we made a mark. Uh, I could go on and on about me, but the, you know, the staff we had was just spectacular. Um, they, they were dedicated, they loved their craft, uh, they understood what was a big event if they were buying boxing events, um, and they were able to kind of project a, a Tiffany kind of attitude and personality to HBO Sports. Um, and sadly, you know, I told you that when I started there, there were three HBO sports employees. When I took over as president of HBO, there were 90 employees. We had a full staff doing real sports on a daily basis. Um, and then we had all the people doing boxing and we had Wimbledon and we had all those documentaries, each had their own staff attached. We had, you know, the accountants and the, and the marketing personnel and the talent. Uh, you know, talent was, as I said earlier, so important to me. And we had people that really honed in on treating that talent uh, with kit gloves and making sure they felt special. Um, but we did first class all the way. And obviously, you know, HBO just exploded with Soprano Sex in the City and became the must-see television uh, for many, many years. But here we are now. You know, I'll end with this. I don't know where the wonderful world of television is going. I know one thing, though. Sports is still driving mass amounts of people to the television set. You know, you're, you're having to go to dinner parties to find out what to watch and where it is. Uh, when it comes to series and, and documentaries that I might make, um, probably three quarters of you didn't even know I did Bill Russell for Netflix. Uh, these these streamers think that just by putting the the print ad up on the screen as you funnel through it will get you to watch a show. Um, but they've all deserted the PR that comes with television uh, in order to attract people to different shows. Everything seems to be word of mouth. In the days, in the big days of HBO. You know, you couldn't walk down a street without seeing a billboard uh, for a big fight or a big show that we had on the air um, or even reading a paper. You know, you couldn't read a paper without seeing articles written all over the place about what we were doing and why you should watch the show that we had just put together. Those days are over. People aren't reading. I'm the only one getting a paper delivered to my house, it seems like. Um, but 
you know, a lot of those days are over. And I think television is changing so rapidly, but there is one reality. You'll always know where the big game is because you'll hunt for it and you'll know on online or just because everyone's paying attention, you know, when your team is playing and what time and where you can find it. Um, and not just your team, but, it, it, you know, a lot of these sports, whether it's the NBA or uh, NFL, that you'll, you'll know as the playoffs roll around where you have to go. Uh, college football, it's all sitting there for you. Um, and you have an awareness of it. And then all of a sudden, you know, 30 million, 40 million households will be watching. Um, maybe in the 20 million range now for the big NFL games. The ratings are up, as you see, if you follow it at all, uh, across the board in sports. So what I'm trying to get at is that there's a certain sadness that a lot of the product that I had done over so many years, uh, whether it's documentaries or even theatrical movies, uh, are tougher to get to people, are tougher to create awareness. Um, and that's a little frustrating um, because I think a lot of what we're doing now is every bit as poignant and impactful as what we did all those years at HBO. Um, but, you know, there, there still remains the magic of a live sporting event. And that will never go away. And that's why you'll always see the networks today really still standing for something and relying on sports to bring mass amounts of people to the television set. And those advertisers know it. And that seems like the only place that an advertiser wants to go uh, in order to get a message put across. So that's my little uh, speech. I, I hope I didn't bore you with it, but I want to take a bunch of questions because I know you probably have many. No, that was just, that was just fantastic. Um, you hit on so many, uh, so many topics. Uh, first of all, personally, I can tell you, Growing up in the New York area, and you mentioned Joe Namath. I mean, you know, as a kid, I was like, oh my God, right? Um, I also happened to be classmates with Jim Craig. Uh, so, so wow. goalie from, yeah, right. So, so you, I mean, you hit, you hit the, the kishkas, right? You hit a lot of, a lot of the topics. And then the last thing you just said. So you're talking to a group. I saw the hands go up, and I'm included in this group. I also got a newspaper delivered. And a lot of guys here probably do. But as an organization, we realized that we need to change as well. Because if, if we want to continue to thrive and have sports webinars in 20 years, my son's on this call, which is great. But to reach the next generation, our kids, and then our grandkids, we need to communicate different ourselves. So mm -hmm. it is a different world. Uh, it's a world we have to adopt to. Um, and so uh, so we, we thank you so, so much. There are many, many, many questions. I'm gonna ask right off the bat, cause I'm interested myself. We see those Emmys behind you. Tell us about those. Well, there's uh, 28 in my office and 28 here. Wow, um, <laughs> that's all? <laughs> yeah. Kravitz is, is, is dying. Look at that. But um, yeah, I mean, that that comes from, you know, having a team that uh, just is so dedicated to putting out quality uh, year in, year out, show after show. And, uh, you know, and picking the compelling kind of stories and all of a sudden, you know, it's not just about figuring out the idea. It's all about execution. And that that goes. That's not just in sports television. That's in every every business every walk of life you know uh you get in those meeting rooms and you to, someone can come up with a great idea and then the challenge is okay execute on, on it and make it happen and uh that's what you know great storytelling is all about um and you because you've all seen bad shows and poor movies and boring movies and shows and you know after 10 minutes you go i don't i don't want to watch this and you turn it off. So when they don't turn it off, 
and it's it leaves them speechless, then these show up. <laughs> Fantastic. Here's a great question. Did you ever have to put your fandom aside for a particular team you rooted for based upon the job that you had? That's a good question. Uh, That's a good question. I think between, uh, you know, we uh, one of the last things that I greenlit at HBO was a documentary on Joe Namath. Um, and I, my other hero is Jim Brown. Um, and I was also a close follower of Muhammad Ali. Uh, I think, you know what, as a journalist- You need to better internet. <laughs> this comes from the great, you know, Rune Arledge. You have to put it aside. I can remember when we did the documentary, Ali Frazier, One Nation Divisible. Um, you know, Ali was, was tough, man. I mean, he was tough on his opponents mentally. And he berated and, and really, gotten some angry uh, press conference brawls, you know, through his his incredible biting trash talking of, of Frazier that actually ruined their relationship for the rest of their lives. So even though I was a real admirer and love in love with Muhammad Ali, the athlete and and the committed um, you know savior in a way for the what was right. Um, I also understood that you had to tell the ugly side of the story, which is the way he treated people uh, that he was fighting. He did it for showbiz reasons to drive in those days closed circuit sales, but it was nasty. So yes, you do it. You have to put it aside. And there were some times where it was difficult. Great, great question. So uh, one of our gentlemen has a great question. Are you gonna write a book about you? Are you going to do an autobiography? You know, I I could and I would, but um, you know, I, I would. There are certain people that you come across, and I know a lot of you probably will agree with this, who were great to you through your career, you know, and did some really nasty things. And I don't know. <laughs> I might have to wait till all those people pass and. Uh, <laughs> and then think about writing it because I'd hate for them to read some of the, the opinions I have on, on how they carry themselves in their careers. Um, but I probably, I don't know. I, I would think I, you know, I would do it a different way than just an autobiography of me. I'd rather teach people how to work inside a corporation through some storytelling um, or teach them how to live their lives in and out of the office, uh, you know, and is, and that's really why I'd write a book, not to kind of say, oh, look what I did, because I didn't do anything, we did. I used to get angry, and this is goes for every walk of business too. I used to get angry when I would be in a meeting and people would use the I word too much. You know, I, 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 I did this, I did that. Because I always felt, and this was probably because of sports and growing up as a football player or rugby player at Brown or whatever, it was all about team and we. I loved using the word we. And so writing a book feels like too much I. <laughs> so uh, another really good question. What's the one story you haven't told that you still would like to tell? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I've got about three or four sitting on my desk that I'm trying to pitch, you know, that, um, that, that need to be told. Uh, it, it's just, you know, it's hard. Selling is hard. I mean, think about it. All those years I was buying and then all of a sudden 2011, I called myself Willie Loman out on the street, suddenly selling all these shows and you get a lot of no's, but, um, I can't think of anything. I mean, did so many. I mean, I felt like the, it was, I know it was a bottomless pit, but I'm really anxious about this movie on the 99ers because I, I know that that movie could be as impact, really more impactful than Miracle because it not only was all about the women's movement uh, and the fact in the 90s, all these Title IX kids had become legitimate, serious athletes that turned 
the entire sports world into following women's sports. You know, I think that I have this vision of teams of soccer players and and every sport, field hockey players and basketball players getting together to go to the theater to watch that movie. And right now I'm a little, you know, we're just getting out of these strikes and we're trying to rewrite the script. Netflix has already announced the movie. So that one, you know, that movies can die at any moment, but that one I really want to see come to fruition and, and execute on it and make it great. Uh, so again, you know, <clears throat> you, you have a pretty much of a particular cohort that you're speaking to today. So the next question is a little subjective, but uh, I think most of us agree. Why are the sports writers today not as good as the writers of the old days? Really good question. Um, you know, in the old days, I'm doing a, a, uh, a podcast, my first podcast on a guy named Hobie Baker from 1911 to 1914. He was the world's greatest hockey player, the first major megastar hockey player. Um, in fact, the top college hockey player every year gets the Hobie Baker Award. Um, and uh, and he, at the time, he was also an All-American football player um, besides this guy named Jim Thorpe. So as a halfback. So, uh, you know, the reason it's amazing that in those days, the greatest writers in America, um, and as time went on, you know, the greatest writers in America were prone to writing about sports because that's where all the storytelling was, and it actually sold papers. You know, they were putting their beautiful prose to the games, not just covering the interceptions and what fumbles. are you doing down here? And so, so lo and behold. You know, all these writers, Rex Lardner uh, and the great Red Smith, as time went on, Dave Anderson, even in the 70s and 80s, you know, they were all gifted writers. And I, I guess a lot, in a lot of ways, the great writers were attracted to writing for newspapers or magazines, Sports Illustrated. Um, and it just that form of medium just died out. And what really bugs me um, is that, you know, everyone thinks the younger generation have this attention span of a gnat and can't read an article over 50 words or watch a, a television show over 10 minutes. Um, and it's just not true. You know, I have kids, they're 35 now, your son is on here. I mean, the kids today want great storytelling. They enjoy it as much as they cry and laugh right along with all of us when they are touched by something on television or in a movie theater. So I just I just think um, there's a, a silliness in a way uh, to following, you know, to, to thinking that a good solid 15 page story in a magazine can't drive people uh, to a story. I'm thinking of. Chris and Martina, you know, if you ever can get your hands on it, uh, the great Sally Jenkins just wrote an article about three months ago on their relationship and getting each other through cancer, Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett. And it's probably one of the greatest articles I think I've ever read in my life. Um, and indeed, a, um, a documentary is going to be made off of that article. Um, and I'm trying to make my way into helping. But, you know, they're still out there. Great writers are still out there. You just gotta search a little bit. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any questions? You can actually just take yourself off mute and ask or we can, uh, we can wrap up. What can you... Can What's your opinion of Vin Scully? You have no more like Vin Scully's or uh, Mel oh, Adams? Yeah, I mean, I, you're okay. Here's the deal Joe Buck, Al Michaels, uh, you know, Jim Nance. There are certain at the top, certain great play by play announcers that live on. Let's not, you know, 
let's not say that that art is uh, is dying. Um, but when you get to a sense of history the way Vince Scully had it, or Bob Costas, you know, who I'm very close to, who still do a game on uh, Turner, by the way, this week. Um, you know, these are exceptional human beings that have photographic memories that that have a prose to the way they speak, um, an understanding of the of the what's in front of them. Jim Lampley on our boxing telecast, same thing. So it's not necessarily dying, but I think the um, I, I think that the medium is not kind of projecting the eye and eagles uh, with the kind of notoriety that these guys had. Maybe it's because there's just too many of them, uh, too many games, and you can't differentiate. Or maybe the people behind the camera are not making the shots when the, the moment's compelling. Uh, and so the, the announcers aren't able to feed off of it. But look, there's never going to be another Vince Scully, ever. So, but um, you know, we've lost some great ones. And it's there's a sadness to that, but time marches on. And th there'll be some great broadcasters that you'll attach yourself to. Great. Thank Ross, you so much. Ross, you were talking about uh, <clears throat> the people's interest in sports, but don't you feel, unfortunately, that people's interest in sports now are driven by sports betting, that their interest is more in the performance of the players and the score and less in the loyalty of a particular team? It's an interesting thing. I mean, that would be more about fantasy than it is betting. I think betting has been around since you know whenever 20 probably but um but i think um i i still think that from generation to generation fathers get their sons and daughters or mothers get their sons and daughters attached to their team and it might not be the team that's in your city um and so i think that passion once it's in your bloodstream and you know who your teams are uh, you you really live vicariously through the exploits of that team on a win and loss basis. And, you know, if they get to the ultimate game and they win, you're sitting there bawling, or at least I would be. Uh, I haven't seen my team do that uh, since 1968. But um, <laughs> the, fact is, the fact is that, you know, you think about the generations, you think about the attachment to your son or your daughter, um, and how you share that, you know, you share that passion. So I don't think that'll ever die. I don't think that betting or fantasy can ever take that. Yeah. I really don't. Harvey Brems, you can take yourself off mute. Yeah, so before you kind of mentioned about the diversity of the broadcast, for example, back when I was a kid, you wanted to watch the Yankees, you watched WPIX. You wanted to watch the Mets, I think it was WOR. There was. Now you want to watch the Yankees. <laughs> you got yes, but then you put on a game and it's somewhere else all the time. And they're not always the same somewhere else. Can you comment on that diversity and what it's doing to games and sports? Yeah, it's, it's actually impacting the fan, the average fan who has the, the team that they follow. Um, and not in a good way, because I think, you know, all that money is spent, but unless you can drive mass amounts of people to those games, I wonder, given the ratings on Apple, uh, I don't know what the ratings are on Yes, but I'm wondering now if it's starting to chip away at how many people are tuning into each and every Yankee game. Uh, because all of a sudden, if you're not following their games on Apple or on TNT, no, or, you're supposed to go to bed. Yeah, then it's nine o'clock. Yes, network on a regular yes. basis either. So it's it's yeah. very it's very tough to know what the impact is. Um, but you can't narrow the audience because if you start narrowing the audience then you're really chipping away at the, the impact of sports. 
Yeah, I think um, if I can talk, that was actually my question. I'm Bob Bob Watts from the FGNC. Uh, you know, uh, in general about the splintering of broadcasting into so many different channels and streams, uh, you know, and whether it's hurt spectator intention, attention. Well, I have to subscribe to, you know, half a dozen different services to see what, what I want to see. And if I can even figure out where the, where the games are, right? Uh, I know. And that, that is going to be more and more of a difficulty because now, guys, I, I have to tell you, as we read every day, you know, and it's part of my job, all of these networks and streamers that are coming on board and recognizing that live sports is such an impactful uh, subscriber hit for them, you know, it's going to get more and more confusing. It's I, I would love to tell you that it's going to be simplified forever, but the only sport that seems fairly simplified is pro football, um, which is on that set of networks. And you know where you're going on Sunday and Monday night and Sunday night, you got your special games and Thursday night, but you know where to go. Um, I'm worried about the NBA and the NHL and Major League Baseball. Um because yeah, these these games are going to be everywhere. Because the the whole trick is, I mean, in my whole career, all the money's coming from television to pay all these players. Let's be honest. I mean, there's a certain amount of revenue that comes in from jerseys or or the, you know the uh, the stands, but the numbers are getting so big, billions and billions of dollars divided by thirty. You know, and, and so every year these owners depend on maximizing television revenue and don't think long and hard enough about what they're doing to the overall sport when they just get the money from five or six sources. Um, Adam, it's up to Adam Silver, Roger Goodell and, you know, the, the commissioners to kind of keep this under control or, or, or we're going to have mayhem. So. <clears throat> We have, uh, if you don't mind staying on a few more minutes. Yeah, okay. I, I okay. just gotta go at nine, so. I know, but uh, we, have, we have a few more really good questions oh, and then yeah. I really wanna ask you to uh, try to answer them. Uh, one of them uh, near and dear to many of us is Sandy Koufax, not playing or pitching on Yom Kippur and the impact it had on the Jewish community um, has there ever been a documentary or is there going to be? I don't recall one, but there's there's one reason why there's never been a documentary on Sandy Koufax, and it's Sandy Koufax. Ah. Um, I've approached him through and actually Scully, uh Costas. Um you know, Sandy is a special human being and doesn't like any of the hoopla doesn't really want to revisit his life or career. He has no skeletons, but he just he's just a special breed of person uh, who never was comfortable. Like I said, what I said about the eye and writing a book, I think he feels that way about a documentary on himself. Um, but it's only because of Sandy and what a story it is. Yeah, we actually know that uh, firsthand. We have uh, every two years we have a convention, and uh, our past convention was in Philadelphia. And someone told us that he could get us Sandy Koufax. Mm -hmm. We didn't get Sandy Koufax. No, <laughs> no. Um, I, I think I've only gotten him for one. No, no, I never got him because I had to ask for him for Brooklyn Dodgers docu's and things. But the only doc you ever did was. Uh, I think for Hank Green, no, on Jewish baseball players. If, if you know of it, there was a documentary once on Jewish baseball players, and Fred Wilpon got Sandy to do an interview. But that's the only known interview that I know that he ever did. Oh, okay. Two more quick questions, and then we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. So were you involved in bringing uh, Grumble to HBO? Yeah, I was involved. Um, I can be honest with this whole staff, though. My first choice was Bob Costas, but the guy who ran NBC, <laughs> um, Dick Ebersol, was not ready for Bob to do real sports with Bob Costas. So the the second choice, and he was obviously right below Bob for me, was uh, 
was Bryant. So we went over myself and Seth Abraham had lunch with him and um, yeah, and convinced him to do real sports. Um, and he was the perfect host. Uh, and it was pretty damn successful. You know, I, I, I put it on a piece of paper, the idea for real sports in 1994 and it debuted in 1995 and it just got off the air this year. So that's quite a run. Uh, this is a really great question, Ron, I'm about to ask you because I was wondering it myself. If a former athlete wants to do color commentary, do they get special training for radio or do they just comment based on their playing? Great a, question. Yeah, it's a great question. Tomorrow I'm doing uh, Chris Collinsworth is being put into the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame and, and they want me to do an interview um, for that night. They're going to play a tape. You know, and a lot of people are doing the beginnings of Chris, but he's a good example because I knew he was a charismatic um, broadcaster when he was playing. You know, he didn't realize it, but he was colorful. When he did an interview, it wasn't just the drips and drabs, the Tom Brady kind of answers. It was it was always colorful. It was truthful. It was impactful. It was fun. And it made sense. And he was smarter than a whip. So the day he got cut, I called up. Uh, him and I said how'd you like to be a broadcaster and uh, he and I said I'd like you to do features for inside the NFL and he goes that sounds great what's a feature and so when he came to HBO the first thing I did was sit him down the same way I sat down with Arthur Ashe or Billie Jean King or George Foreman or Sugar Ray Leonard and I said look you've been on a fence your whole career so far Chris was one of the few that wasn't but I said, now you're going to have to really analyze the game that you're doing. And you're going to have to understand that the athletes may get upset if you criticize them, but it's also coming from you. You know, you're Billie Jean King or you're Sugar Ray Leonard. So they're going to respect what you say. So, you, but you got to get off the fence. That's the number one teaching tool for any would be athlete turned broadcaster. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we just lost up here in Boston. We just lost Tim Wakefield. Uh, he was a great, um, obviously a great person and pitcher, but also a great broadcaster. But they're not always necessarily so. And so I thought that was a really, really good uh, question. So um, we are uh, humbled and, and, and thank you so much. Um, I, I, I want to call out my partner, though, uh, David Kravitz because uh, it's David's passion and persistence. Because I just asked, text David while you're saying, how can we get this guy on me? <laughs> and you can't say no to Kravitz, right? Yeah. So David, uh, Yosher um, um uh, on, on having uh, Ross tonight. And, and Ross, so you know, uh, we have these all the time. We started this during the pandemic because everyone was home. And we've had so many sports affinity that we've lost count, honestly, of how many we have. We actually have another big one coming up. Mark your calendars, guys. Tuesday, November 7th, 8, 8 o'clock Eastern, David Richmond, uh, who has a personal connection with Wilt Chamberlain. Mm -hmm. And we're going to uh, learn all about Wilt, Ike, and me with David Richmond. So that's really special and we do tend to be a little biased towards new england since both kravitz and i live up here we're actually going to have a new england patriots cheerleader in december <laughs> i'm not making this up <laughs> what's her is name she, david is she, is she jewish she's oh, not yes. jewish she is jewish she's very jewish Elijah Kanner. She, she worked for federation full-time jewish federation full-time and she's not a cheerleader Fox girlfriend <laughs> Not Grok's girlfriend. There no. you go. See, you just learned something. And that's December. What is it, David? December? Okay, so that's December 19th. I mean, that's pretty good, huh? Well, she's got nothing to cheer about this year, so she might as well come on and do this. No, it's actually a really challenging <laughs> job because they're, they're the embarrassment of the NFL. But anyway, so, Ross. Thank you. Thank you, Ross, thank you, thank you, thank you so fun. much. A lot of this fun. Yeah, that was terrific. Absolutely fantastic. David, anything else? Um, for, well, I just want to thank Danny, my, my co-chairman, my buddy. 
for helping me out as always. And my IT mavens, who I usually make absolutely crazy, Stan, Stan Greenspan, Rick Ronsberg, Creighton Cohn, because uh, these guys are, are unbelievable. Uh, and, you know, Ross, I'm just... I'm just in awe of this whole. This is just absolutely amazing. I'm, I love failing. I'm failing. HBO Sports is incredible. Uh, I really, really appreciate you giving Thanks. your time to come on tonight. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm. This has been. You've been absolutely phenomenal. So I really, I really. Want and to we really, you. Ross, we really thank you for taking our minds just momentarily yeah. away from what's going yeah. on yeah. in in Israel. Um, yeah. So thank you for that, and, and yeah. God bless the state of Israel, and God thank bless. you very much. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you. Night.